Chapter Four of the Iron Heel by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matt Saw. Slaves of the Machine. The more I thought of Jackson's arm, the more shaken I was. I was confronted by the concrete. For the first time I was seeing life. My university life and study and culture had not been real. I had learned nothing but theories of life and society that looked all very well on the printed page. But now I had seen life itself. Jackson's arm was a fact of life. The fact, man, the irrefragable fact, of Ernest's was ringing in my consciousness. It seemed monstrous, impossible that our whole society was based upon blood. And yet there was Jackson. I could not get away from him. Constantly my thoughts swung back to him as the compass to the pole. He had been monstrously treated. His blood had not been paid for in order that a larger dividend might be paid. And I knew a score of happy, complacent families that had received those dividends, and by that much had profited by Jackson's blood. If one man could be so monstrously treated, and society move on its way unheeding, might not many men be so monstrously treated? I remembered Ernest's women of Chicago who toiled for ninety cents a week, and the child slaves of the southern cotton mills he had described. And I could see their wan white hands, from which the blood had been pressed, at work upon the cloth out of which had been made my gown. And then I thought of the Sierra Mills and the dividends that had been paid, and I saw the blood of Jackson upon my gown as well. Jackson, I could not escape. Always my meditations led me back to him. Down in the depths of me I had a feeling that I stood on the edge of a precipice. It was as though I were about to see a new and awful revelation of life. And not I alone. My whole world was turning over. There was my father. I could see the effect Ernest was beginning to have on him. And then there was the bishop. When I had last seen him he had looked a sick man. He was at high nervous tension, and in his eyes there was unspeakable horror. From the little I learned, I knew that Ernest had been keeping his promise of taking him through hell. But what scenes of hell the bishop's eyes had seen I knew not, for he seemed too stunned to speak about them. Once, the feeling strong upon me that my little world and all the world was turning over, I thought of Ernest as the cause of it. And also I thought, we were so happy and peaceful before he came. And the next moment, I was aware that the thought was a treason against truth, and Ernest rose before me transfigured, the apostle of truth, with shining brows and the fearlessness of one of God's own angels, battling for the truth and the right, and battling for the succor of the poor, and lonely, and oppressed. And then there arose before me another figure, the Christ. He, too, had taken the part of the lowly and oppressed, and against all the established power of priest and Pharisee and I remembered his end upon the cross, and my heart contracted with a pang as I thought of Ernest. Was he, too, destined for a cross? He, with his clarion call and war-noted voice, and all the fine man's vigour of him. And in that moment I knew that I loved him, and that I was melting with desire to comfort him. I thought of his life, a sordid, harsh, and meagre life it must have been, and I thought of his father, who had lied and stolen for him and been worked to death. And he himself had gone into the mills when he was ten. All my heart seemed bursting with desire to fold my arms around him and to rest his head on my breast, his head that must be weary with so many thoughts, and to give him rest, just rest, and easement and forgetfulness for a tender space. I met Colonel Ingram at a church reception, him I knew well, and had known him well for many years. I trapped him behind large palms and rubber plants, though he did not know he was trapped. He met me with the conventional gaiety and gallantry. He was ever a graceful man, diplomatic, tactful, and considerate. And as for appearance, he was the most distinguished-looking man in our society. Beside him, even the venerable head of the university looked tawdry and small. And yet I found Colonel Ingram situated the same as the unlettered mechanics. He was not a free agent. He, too, was bound upon the wheel. I shall never forget the change in him when I mentioned Jackson's case. His smiling good nature vanished like a ghost. A sudden, frightful expression distorted his well-bred face. I felt the same alarm that I had felt when James Smith broke out. But Colonel Ingram did not curse. That was the slight difference that was left between the working man and him. He was framed as a wit. But he had no wit now, and unconsciously, 
This way and that he glanced for avenues of escape, but he was trapped amid the palms and rubber trees. Oh, he was sick of the sound of Jackson's name. Why had I brought the matter up? He did not relish my joke. It was poor taste on my part and very inconsiderate. Did I not know that in his profession personal feelings did not count? He left his personal feelings at home when he went down to the office. At the office he had only professional feelings. Should Jackson have received damages? I asked. Certainly, he answered. That is, personally, I have a feeling that he should. But that has nothing to do with the legal aspects of the case. He was getting his scattered wits slightly in hand. Tell me, has right anything to do with the law? I asked. You have used the wrong initial consonant, he smiled in answer. Might? I queried, and he nodded his head. And yet we are supposed to get justice by means of the law? That is the paradox of it, he countered. We do get justice. You are speaking professionally now, are you not? I asked. Colonel Ingram blushed, actually blushed, and again he looked anxiously about him for a way of escape. But I blocked his path and did not offer to move. Tell me, I said, when one surrenders his personal feelings to his professional feelings, may not the action be defined as a sort of spiritual mayhem? I did not get an answer. Colonel Ingram had ingloriously bolted, overturning a palm in his flight. Next I tried the newspapers. I wrote a quiet, restrained, dispassionate account of Jackson's case. I made no charges against the men with whom I had talked, nor for that matter did I even mention them. I gave the actual facts of the case, the long years Jackson had worked in the mills, his effort to save the machinery from damage and the consequent accident, and his own present wretched and starving condition. The three local newspapers rejected my communication, likewise did the two weeklies. I got hold of Percy Layton. He was a graduate of the university, had gone in for journalism, and was then serving his apprenticeship as reporter on the most influential of the three newspapers. He smiled when I asked him the reason the newspapers suppressed all mention of Jackson or his case. Editorial policy, he said. We have nothing to do with that. It's up to the editors. But why is it policy? I asked. We're all solid with the corporations. If you paid advertising rates, you couldn't get any such matter into the papers. A man who tried to smuggle it in would lose his job. You couldn't get it in if you paid ten times the regular advertising rates. How about your own policy? I questioned. It would seem your function is to twist truth at the command of your employers, who in turn obey the behests of the corporations. I haven't anything to do with that. He looked uncomfortable for the moment and then brightened as he saw his way out. I, myself, do not write untruthful things. I keep square all right with my own conscience. Of course, there's lots that's repugnant in the course of the day's work, but then you see that's all part of the day's work. He wound up boyishly. Yet you expect to sit at an editor's desk some day and conduct a policy? I'll be case-hardened by that time, was his reply. Since you are not yet case-hardened, tell me what you think right now about the general editorial policy. I don't think, he answered quickly. One can't kick over the ropes if he's going to succeed in journalism. I've learned that much at any rate. And he nodded his young head sagely. But the right? I persisted. Oh, you don't understand the game. Of course it's all right, because it comes out all right, don't you see? Delightfully vague, I murmured. But my heart was aching for the youth of him. I felt that I must either scream or burst into tears. I was beginning to see through the appearances of the society in which I had always lived, and to find the frightful realities that were beneath. There seemed a tacit conspiracy against Jackson, and I was aware of a thrill of sympathy for the whining lawyer who had ingloriously fought his case. But this tacit conspiracy grew large. Not alone was it aimed against Jackson. It was aimed against every working man who was maimed in the mills. And if against every man in the mills, why not against every man in all the other factories and mills? In fact, was it not true of all the industries? And if this was so, then society was a lie. I shrank back from my own conclusions. It was too terrible and awful to be true. But there was Jackson, and Jackson's arm, and the blood that stained my gown and dripped from my own roof beams. And there were many Jacksons, hundreds of them in the mills alone, as Jackson himself had said. Jackson, I could not escape. I saw Mr. Wixon and Mr. Pertonwaith, the two men who held most of the stock in the Sierra Mills. But I could not shake them as I had shaken the mechanics in their employ. 
I discovered that they had an ethic superior to that of the rest of society. It was what I may call the aristocratic ethic, or the master ethic. Note. Before Avis Everhard was born, John Stuart Mill, in his essay On Liberty, wrote, Wherever there is an ascendant class, a large portion of the morality emanates from its class interests and its class feelings of superiority. They talked in large ways of policy, and they identified policy and right, and to me they talked in fatherly ways, patronizing my youth and inexperience. They were the most hopeless of all I had encountered in my quest. They believed absolutely that their conduct was right. There was no question about it, no discussion. They were convinced that they were the saviors of society, and that it was they who had made happiness for the many, and they drew pathetic pictures of what would be the sufferings of the working class were it not for the employment that they and they alone, by their wisdom, provided for it. Fresh from these two masters, I met Ernest and related my experience. He looked at me with a pleased expression and said, Really, this is fine. You are beginning to dig truth for yourself. It is your own empirical generalization, and it is correct. No man in the industrial machine is a free-will agent except the large capitalist, and he isn't, if you'll pardon the Irishism. Note. Verbal contradictions, called bulls, were long an amiable weakness of the ancient Irish. You see, the masters are quite sure that they are right in what they are doing. That is the crowning absurdity of the whole situation. They are so tied by their human nature that they can't do a thing unless they think it is right. They must have a sanction for their acts. When they want to do a thing, in business, of course, they must wait till there arises in their brain somehow a religious or ethical or scientific or philosophic concept that the thing is right. And then they go ahead and do it, unwitting that one of the weaknesses of the human mind is that the wish is parent to the thought. No matter what they want to do, the sanction always comes. They are superficial casuists. They are Jesuitical. They even see their way to doing wrong that right may come of it. One of the pleasant and axiomatic fictions they have created is that they are superior to the rest of mankind in wisdom and efficiency. Therefrom comes their sanction to manage the bread and butter of the rest of mankind. They have even resurrected the theory of the divine right of kings, commercial kings in their case. Note. The newspapers in 1902 of that era credited the president of the Anthracite Coal Trust, George F. Baer, with the enunciation of the following principle. The rights and interests of the laboring man will be protected by the Christian men to whom God, in his infinite wisdom, has given the property interests of the country. The weakness in their position lies in that they are merely businessmen. They are not philosophers. They are not biologists nor sociologists. If they were, of course, all would be well. A businessman who was also a biologist and a sociologist would know approximately the right thing to do for humanity. But outside the realm of business, these men are stupid. They know only business. They do not know mankind nor society, and yet they set themselves up as arbiters of the fates of the hungry millions and all the other millions thrown in. History some day will have an excruciating laugh at their expense. I was not surprised when I had my talk out with Mrs. Wixon and Mrs. Pertonwaithe. They were society women. Note. Society is here used in a restricted sense, a common usage of the times to denote the gilded drone that did no labor, but only glutted themselves at the honey vats of the workers. Neither the businessmen nor the laborers had time or opportunity for society. Society was the creation of the idle rich who toiled not, and who in this way played. Their homes were palaces. They had many homes scattered over the country, in the mountains, on lakes, and by the sea. They were tended by armies of servants, and their social activities were bewildering. They patronized the university and the churches, and the pastors especially bowed at their knees in meek subservience. Note. Bring on your tainted money, was the expressed sentiment of the church during this period. There were powers, these two women. What of the money that was theirs? The power of subsidization of thought was theirs to a remarkable degree, as I was soon to learn under Ernest's tuition. They aped their husbands and talked in the same large ways about policy and the duties and responsibilities of the rich. They were swayed by the same ethic that dominated their husbands, the ethic of their class, and they uttered glib phrases that their own ears did not understand. Also, they grew irritated when I told them of the deplorable condition of Jackson's family. 
and when I wondered that they had made no voluntary provision for the man, I was told that they thanked no one for instructing them in their social duties. When I asked them flatly to assist Jackson, they as flatly refused. The astounding thing about it was that they refused in almost identically the same language, and this in face of the fact that I interviewed them separately, and that one did not know that I had been or was going to see the other. Their common reply was that they were glad of the opportunity to make it perfectly plain that no premium would ever be put on carelessness by them, nor would they, by paying for accident, tempt the poor to hurt themselves in the machinery. Note. In the files of the Outlook, a critical weekly of the period, in the number dated August 18th, 1906, is related the circumstance of a working man losing his arm, the details of which are quite similar to those of Jackson's case as related by Avis Everhard. And they were sincere, these two women. They were drunk with conviction of the superiority of their class and of themselves. They had a sanction in their own class ethic for every act they performed. As I drove away from Mrs. Pertonwaith's great house, I looked back at it, and I remembered Ernest's expression that they were bound to the machine, but that they were so bound that they sat on top of it. End of chapter 4 Recording by Matt Saw, Montreal, mattsaw.org.